All right, so we shall start the second part of the mini course by Professor Lakshit Vagalat. And uh, okay, Lakshit, please. Yeah, okay, so thanks, Roger. So now that I've presented this, uh, this discrete time model, I'm gonna give an example of this systematic supply and demand. And actually, I'm gonna stick to that afterwards. So if you remember, we had this, this type of dynamics. So you have a price, SK. So SK is a multidimensional price, right? So SK1, SKN. It moves from SK to SK exponential ZK plus one. So ZK plus one are the fundamentals of the market. And then, because of a certain rule which is followed by the market, or at least the part of the market in aggregate, price moves again from SK exponential to SK exponential times this correction term, right? And you see here that I've taken a very uh, general setting where this phi i here can be anything, right? So phi i in the context of options trading is the delta of the option. In the context of leverage uh, rebalancing, it's the, it's the strategy of keeping a fixed leverage on a, on a fund. In the context of distressed selling, it's going to be a rule which implies that you sell when you lose a certain amount of, of cash. Right? So actually, I'm going to give and focus on one example, which is going to be the supply and demand generated by fire sales. So as I told you, fire sales are uh, forced sales of assets, which have very various origins. It can be because of capital constraints, which are imposed by the regulator. It can be because of investors redeeming their, their positions in a fund because of collateral, because of lots of other reasons, right? So now we want to give an idea about the phi i here, which corresponds to fire sales, right? So I'm gonna look here at a market with capital J funds. So typically it can be mutual funds, pension funds, those guys who, are comp who have to deal with a heavy regulation, right? So they have a lot of constraints which are imposed to them by regulator or by their own clients or sometimes by themselves, right? And so the value of fund J at date TK is the sum of alpha IJ SKI. So alpha IJ is the number of shares of fund J on asset I. Okay, so it's the, the number of shares. And of course, the value of the fund is just the sum of number of shares, shares times the, the, the value of the asset. So the thing that happens is that now this SK, you know, we, we saw that it can move from SK to SK exponential something, right? And so because of those exogenous moves, the value of the fund itself moves, right? And because when the value of the fund moves too much, sometimes the fund manager has to react and has to liquidate some assets. You have possible fire sales, which might be generated by those exogenous moves. Okay. So that's exactly what's happening in practice. You look at the market, you have a shock, which is exogenous, Lehman Brothers comes like that. Uh, something exogenous comes, prices drops, and then you have to react to this drop in prices because of an exogenous rule. Okay, so now, how can we model this exogenous rule? When you want to model fire sales, you have to understand where the fire sales you, 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 you may try to, to, to model each origin of fire sales, but the problem is that there is a lot of different origins for fire sales, capital ratio constraints, collateral, et cetera, et cetera. So what we want to do here, we want to stay more generic and say, okay, in general, how do fire sales work in a, in a fund? Well, what happens is that, well, what we discussed in the beginning, if you look at the fund, as long as the fund doesn't lose too much, there are no fire sales, okay? And that's typical of mutual funds. When you're an investor in a mutual fund, if the mutual fund just loses a few percent, you're not gonna withdraw straight away your, your cash, right? So there's kind of a threshold after which, a, a, a threshold for losses, actually, after which you're gonna start to withdraw money or start to sell assets, okay? Also, what we said is that once fire sales start, the more the fund value decreases, the more intense the fire sale phenomenon. So it means that after a small shock, you have maybe some actors which are selling. After a larger shock, the volume is much bigger, right? It's not something linear. Okay. And so actually what we're going to do is we're going to model that. So maybe graphically it's going to be easier to, to see. 
Yes. Is it uh, taken into account by the fact that the phi that you have for a given period of time becomes part of the z for the next period of time? So that yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you yeah. do have this acceleration yeah. in the model. In the model, you have that. But you can also input that in another way, which is looking at this, because it's not the same thing, as this f being concave, which is that. Well, it's not linear, right? So the, 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 if you liquidate, I don't know, 10 million for a 1%, 5% loss, you're going to liquidate more than 20 million for a 10% loss, right? That's the, the thing which, so the, those are two things, right? So let's look at that graphically and then look at the math of that. How does it work? Deleveraging schedule. Because I want to model fire sales in a very generic manner, I'm going to introduce a deleveraging schedule, which is called here F which is a function which is going to drive my rule for fire sales. So f is going to be constant here, which means that when, so this is the loss here, right? And this is the, the loss in fund value, and this is the volume which is sold okay, in percentage. So when the, the loss is not too big, here you sell zero, okay? But as soon as the loss exceeds a certain threshold, you start to sell a certain proportion of your fund. So here, for example, when the, the fund goes from VK to VK plus one, you sell this difference, which is, well, here, for the purpose of the graphical vi visualization, it's almost 40%, right? So that's a big number so that you can see properly, but usually it can be 5% or 10% of the fund, okay? How do you model that? You model that by looking at an F, which is a function of the fund value initially and the function at the of the fund value after the exogenous move. So VK is the fund value at the K, and this thing here, which is here, is the fund value after the exogenous move, so after the, the ZK plus one. So it's right here, okay? And then, because your fund value here is given here, you're gonna liquidate a proportion of your fund which is given by this number here, okay? So it's a very generic thing, right? It's F of a, fund value minus F of the new fund value, okay? And your F really depends on your rule, okay? If you are constrained by a risk-weighted capital constraint, you have a certain F. If you are constrained by a leverage ratio constraint, you have another F. If you are constrained by investors redeeming their positions, you have another F still, okay? And it's your job as a bank to know. For example, banks, they know explicitly their F because the F is imposed by Basel, okay? It's more complicated but for a fund because you don't really know how investors are going to take back their money. But still, you may have some estimates of historically how people have withdrawn their money. Okay. But what's nice here is that we're not assuming any particular form of F, except that F is increasing, which means that when the fund value decreases, you sell assets. And it's concave, which means that the, the, the more the fund value decreases, the more you sell. Also, one last thing, F is constant here, which means that as long as the fund value doesn't decrease too much, you don't liquidate anything. So all those things are pretty intuitive, right? That's how it's, it works in practice. It's like you, you don't sell a significant part of your position except when you have lost enough, and enough depends on your exogenous constraints, right? And then you're gonna start to sell a certain amount of, of, of assets, okay? So now there's a question which is F here, gives a proportion of the fund which is sold. So for example, let's look at here. I have to sell 40% of my fund. So if my, if my fund is 100 million, I have to, to, to raise 40 million by selling 40 million of assets, okay? So now the question is, how do I sell? Am I going to sell first the most liquid asset, or am I going to sell proportionally, et cetera, et cetera? There's a lot of different manners of selling uh, 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 optimally selling your portfolio, right? Here, what I'm going to assume is that I'm selling proportionally in each asset. So that means that when I sell here 40% of my fund, I'm going to sell 40% in each of my positions. 40% in asset one, 40% of my position in asset two, etc., until asset N. Okay? That might not be the, the, the wisest thing, but that's what I assume here. We can do all the calculations again 
with, by introducing a rate of liquidation for each asset, but that's more complicated. The thing which is nice when you look at proportional liquidations is that everything stays tractable, right? So that's very nice for us, especially in continuous time limits, but you have to know that if you are just looking at having a number which quantifies your risk, you can just do simulations of any type of liquida liquidation strategy that you want. Right? So in my, uh, in my uh, setting here, I'm going to look at a fund which suffers from potentially a loss and liquidates proportionally and has a linear impact on the assets. Okay? So once again, all those things, linear impact, proportional liquidations, you can relax them and do lots of things which are more refined. Okay, so here for the purpose of clarity, I'm looking at linear price impact, proportional liquidation, which is going to enable to have very simple and intuitive results. So that's an example of an F, right? And actually from now on, I'm going to replace this phi i, which was very general, by this F here which is another phi i, but a very specific form of phi i, which is linked to fire sales. Okay. So the thing now is that we have a discrete time dynamics for the assets, and under some conditions which are here, so on the rate of, of uh, uh, liquidations, you can show that this thing, this dynamics here, which is here, for the phi i, which is the f that I showed, is a Markov chain. So it's just a very simple result, but what's nice is that when you have Markov chains, it's very easy to do a lot of simulations, right? It's very easy to simulate. So I'm gonna uh, 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 expose some simulation results. In the papers, there's a lot of results concerning simulations, so if you're interested, you can look into that. But let's look at the results of simulations. I think it, it gives a, a lot of intuition about, about what's happening here. So. Let's look at a market with two assets, okay? So there are two assets, one fund, and the two assets are fundamentally uncorrelated. Okay, so you're like a, a, a smart fund manager, right? And you found two uncorrelated assets. That's what lots of fund managers dream about, right? But you're pretty big in this market. Pretty big means that here you own 10% of the liquidity. And the problem is that here, as soon as you lose more than 5%, you're going to start to liquidate a little bit. Right? That's typically the case because of a capital ratio constraint. Okay? So you have a fund investing in two assets which have zero fundamental correlation, but which may impact in a systematic manner those asset prices because it has to liquidate sometimes. Almost always, the fund doesn't liquidate, right? Because it doesn't lose 5%. But in the particular scenarios where the fund loses 5%, it has to liquidate. Okay. So here, I'm going to simulate 100,000 times this market with this F here, which is here, right? And I simulate 100,000 times one year for this market, okay? And for one year, I'm going to compute the realized correlation between asset one and asset two. There are two assets, right? So normally, if there was no feedback, the correlation should be on average zero, right? Because I started with a fundamental correlation of zero. And what I end up with, so I'm drawing here the distribution of those correlations. Okay. So what I'm drawing here is, in green, the distribution of the correlation in the case where there is no feedback and you have something which is uh, expected, centered around zero with a certain error. So it means that you have a market where the fundamental correlation is zero. You observe the market. The realized correlation that you observe is not necessarily exactly zero, but it's close to zero. Okay? Of course, you have an error. In some cases of the market, you have sometimes bigger correlations. But on average, if you look at 100,000 path of this market, you have something which is centered around zero. But then when you add the fact that the fund may impact the prices, you have the blue distribution. And what you observe is that the distribution of correlation is quite skewed and has a heavy tail. So what does that mean? It means that now the correlation between those two assets is no longer centered around zero. 
it's more, or actually the average is more on 15, 20%. But what's even more interesting is that there are quite a number of scenarios where the correlation is above 40%, which is much more than those zero that you were expecting. Okay? So you see that this here, heavy tail, is generated with a model where the fundamental correlation is zero. So you start with something which is uncorrelated fundamentally, but because of your own action, it's going to get correlated. Now, when you condition on the fact that you liquidate, so you're looking now uh, here at the correlation distribution exactly in the path where my fund lost 5% and I had to liquidate. Well, here it's even worse. The correlation is even more skewed to the right. So it means that precisely in the scenarios where I lose a lot, so more than 5%, because of my own action, I'm going to make correlations increase. And that's very bad because in the beginning, I had chosen those two assets because they were supposedly uncorrelated, right? Because I wanted diversification effects. But actually, precisely when I need those diversification effects, so when I've lost a certain amount, 5% here in this model, precisely then, the, f the assets are not going to behave as zero correlation, but more 20, 30, sometimes 40% correlation. That's very bad for my diversification. So that's correlation. You can look at fund volatility. Same thing here. In green, you have the fund volatility distribution, something centered around 17%. But in blue, with the feedback, you observe that because of the action of the fund itself, the volatility is skewed to the right. So there are a lot of scenarios where the volatility is larger than expected. The guy here, fund manager, expects something around 17%. There's a lot of, of scenarios above 25%. Yes? What is the frequency in which you observe this phenomenon in practice? Is it intraday? Is it over seven Ah, OK. Days? So it's more daily or weekly, yeah. Not intraday. Yes. They, yeah, yeah, yeah. They occur the yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. I, I'm I not look. I use that as crisis predictors. Okay. Yeah. I, mean, I don't. The, the PAG, yeah, yeah, that's true. Was exactly based on that, but as a predictor. Yeah. So, so here, uh, when I when I do those things of estimations that you probably saw. Uh, because I'm looking a lot at realized things, I don't use them as predictors. But it's true that when you look at implied values, you can use that as predictors. The deformation of yeah. correlations so the and volatilities. That yes. So that's yeah. That's yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, so same thing here. If you condition on the path where the fund liquidated, you see that Heavy, once again, the heavy tail in the volatility. So it means that precisely in the scenarios where the fund is doing bad, so bad here is the fund has to liquidate some assets, precisely the volatility is going to be increased because of the fund's own actions. Right? Here, there's only one fund. So it's not even the fault of someone else, right? It's the fund's own actions because of a rule which is imposed maybe by a regulator or someone else. But it's the fund's own actions which is going to generate this heavy tail. So now what I'm going to do is, well, first summarize this thing, this, uh, those results on, on uh, the numerics, which is that correlations and fund. Yes, uh, Stefano? One quick question. The correlation shows with one-year correlation. So here, yeah. So here, one simulation is a simulation of 250 trading days, so one year, right? And then I calculate the realized correlation, which is one number. I have 100,000 simulations, so I have 100,000 numbers, and this is the distribution. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now what we're going to do is that here, clearly, it appears that there is an effect of the systematic rebalancing of the, of the fund, right? But you can still argue that it's numerical results and that maybe I cheated on my parameters and chose extreme parameters, and that's, and that's worthless. <laughs> 
So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to quantify a bit more the effect of those systematic trades on the correlation structure and on the fund structure so that we have an idea about what's at stake here and what's important and what's not that important, right? So how do we do that? And I think it's a very interesting method, especially for the, the students who are here and, and are interested in financial modeling. One way of doing that is looking at this model that I presented, which is a discrete time model here. So SK, SK plus one, SK plus two, et cetera. And then making the time step between TK and TK plus one. So this time step, we call it delta T, right? Make it go to zero. So actually here, we're gonna look at the convergence of this discrete time model when the time step goes to zero. So of course, from a discrete time model, it's gonna be a continuous time limit, okay? The thing which is interesting with a continuous time limit is that things get much more tractable. Here, if I want to look at, well, as Stefano said, the one-year correlation, I cannot have a, a, a simple formula like that. But when I look at something continuous, the formula will be obvious, okay? So here, all the goal of my previous slide, of my next slides, is to find the continuous time limit of this, of this discrete time model, okay? So I'm gonna look at this convergence theorem, which is an interesting theorem, and which is the following. First, I'm going to look at a, a weak convergence, so a convergence in low, which is defined here. So what's the convergence in low? We say that x indexed by delta t converges in low to xt, to this process, so it's a convergence of processes, right? If for any functional which is bounded or, well, here it's not a G, it's an F, right? The expected value of F of this delta, of this X indexed by delta T goes to the expected value of F without the delta T when delta T goes to zero. Okay? So that's the definition of a convergence in low, right? And I'm going to do that for my model here. So here the delta T was the trading step and the X here is the S, the time step, the, the price. So it's a vector, okay? So in order to do that, I'm going to make some assumptions, so don't, uh, uh, don't get too blocked by those assumptions. That's merely technical assumptions, which is that the function, liquidation functions are smooth enough, and the innovations, xi, you know, the, the noise, right, are, have some smoothness also. And then I'm going to look at this thing. Under those assumptions, when delta t goes to zero, the discrete time uh, dynamics converges in low, in low, so as defined in the previous slides, to the solution of a stochastic differential equation. So the discrete time price was S, continuous time price is P, and the stochastic differential equation verified by P is given here. The drift is mu i, the volatility function is a multidimensional volatility matrix. It's sigma. Mu i is given by this line, which is a bit complicated. Sigma is given by this line, which is less complicated. I'm gonna insist a lot on that, right? But what you see here is that it's possible to explicitly state the limit okay, as a function of all the parameters of the model. You see that the drift in the limit depends on the drift initially and all those factors, which is the market depth, the positions of the fund, the values of the funds, the rates of liquidations, all those things are incorporated in the limit. Okay. Okay, so that's the continuous time limit. So how do we find that? So first, why do we do that? Why do we do that? It's because once you have a continuous time limit now, it's very easy to calculate correlations of volatilities, right? It's just an integral of something which is here, right? Whereas when you have a, a discrete time model and you want to lo look at the correlation in 10 steps, it's much more com complicated, okay? Another thing which is very important is that if I had started this course by saying, we're gonna study a market continuous time which is like that, people would just say, why? Right? There is no reason that the market should look like that. It doesn't, doesn't have any meaning like that when I look into that. 
the thing which is very powerful with this type of approach is that by starting with a discrete time model, you start with something which is very intuitive. Price SK, which moves to SK exponential ZK plus one, and then moves again. No one can argue against that. That's how it works in life, right? In practice, it works like that. Right? But then, by looking at the continuous time limit of that, you hold, you obtain something which is much more tractable. And that's very interesting in terms of risk management, risk measures, and things like that. Okay, so there are two, really two, two, two uh, advantages of doing that. One is obtaining tractable things, and another thing is that you cannot just start with the continuous time limit because it's not possible to justify this form, right? You have to start with something intuitive, which is discrete time, and then look at the continuous time limit. All right, so how do I obtain this? Okay. Yes? You are assuming that you're continuing with the same rule of duration. Yes, here, yeah. More and more often. Yeah. Because this might not be the, 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 the same thing you're going to see in the market. Sure, the market. Well, if you look at the bank, for example, they have one constraint, which is Basel, right? So you know the constraints. Okay for the, for the, yeah, it's the, true that for a fund, it's more, maybe more volatile, yeah. yeah. That might change. So here we say that you have a rule which is aggregate and doesn't change. Yeah. That's typically the case for a bank. And, and for continuous time, for more than one year. No, 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 no. Continuous time doesn't mean that you extend the horizon, right? You look at, for example, one year, but instead of looking every day, you look at things which are intraday. You, d you don't extend the horizon, right? So that's important because you can choose. You, no, no, you. Yes. Yeah, but usually that doesn't work like that. Usually you have a rule for the next month or next years, right? And continuous time doesn't mean that you are not looking at one year or 10 years. It's looking at one year, but in continuous time. It was for a day, yes. Yeah. But you can do 250 delta T's for one year. Right? And then if you do two ice pipe per day, you have 500 of them. Right? That's, that doesn't change here. Right? Okay, so how do we obtain these kind of results? So it's a, it's a very nice theorem, uh, which is just convergence of, well, actually, for those who are a bit uh, uh, interested in stochastic calculus, it's really a converge, convergence theorem of a random walk to a Brownian motion, except that here, the random walk is much more complicated because it's not a real random walk. There is a systematic effect which comes from this systematic trading. And so the ending, the ending uh, 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 dynamics is not a Brownian motion, but it's something which is more complicated, which is a solution of a stochastic differential equation. Right? So how do I find this thing? It's a linear non-linear. Uh, well, in which way linear? It's not linear because there's fun value here. But it's yeah, a... That's, yeah, that's what I was thinking. No, yeah, no, it's not linear. Exactly, yeah. 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 I think that it's intuitive that it's not linear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, op you, you start with something linear but by introducing the feedback, which is non-linear. Here it's concave. You end up with something which is not. Yeah. So the first, uh, the first thing to do is try to identify in the limit the volatility matrix and the drift vector. So here I set up a matrix which is SISJ times this sigma sigma transpose which is defined here. Okay. And this BI which is the drift here. Okay. So I just scale everything by the prices. Okay. So I have an A, I have a B, right, which are kind of intuitive to find. And then I have three conditions to verify. First is that from one period to another, there cannot be a significant jump, right? So here, the probability that the difference between two dates is la uh, the, oh, between two prices is larger than epsilon goes to zero, even when it's scaled by delta t and when delta t goes to zero. This thing here, this condition here, will ensure that in the limit you have something which has no jumps. That's why we have a stochastic differential equation. That's just a technical limit here, the technical uh, uh, condition. Then 
you're looking at the drift. How can you make sure that the drift B here will be the drift of the limit? You check that expected value of the increment, conditional on the, on the past, right? And scaled by delta t is equal to bi, or at the limit at least. Okay. So this will ensure that at the limit, the dst that you find will have this drift b. Okay. And then you look at the covariances. So here you look at the expected cross increments, which is the difference of SKI and SKJ. When you scale them, it should converge to AIJ. So it has to be zero. Once you've verified those three things, you check that the Martingale problem, which is associated to this A and B, is well posed. So there's one way which is very easy to check that the Martingale problem is well posed, is that the associated stochastic differential equation has a unique strong solution. And this is very easy also because one sufficient condition is that the, 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 the coefficients are Lipschitz, right? So here actually those complicated conditions on F are just to make sure that the coefficients A and B are Lipschitz, that's all, okay? And once you have all that, you have a theorem, which is taken here by Ethier Kurt, but lots of people made different versions of this theorem, which says that if this SK is a Markov chain, verifies those three conditions, here no jumps, here the drift, here the co covariance uh, function, and if the Martingale problem which is associated to this operator is well posed, which is once again the case if the coefficients are Lipschitz, then this Discrete time dynamics, delta x indexed by delta t, converges in low when delta t goes to zero to the solution of an SD or to the solution of the Martingale problem which is associated to this generator. Okay? And of course, this is going to be the solution of the SD that I showed here. Okay? So that's how you obtain this SD. Okay? So what, it's, it's, uh, it's not very complicated, it's really looking at the discrete time model, trying to identify sigma and, and mu, so you have A and B, and then you check three things, which is this, this, and this. Check that the coefficients are Lipschitz, for example, and then you have the, your, your limits. Okay. And so you have this thing here. Okay. And now that we have this continuous time limit, it's great because you can do everything in a tractable manner. And one thing that we like to do to quantify this impact, I've talked a lot about correlations. One thing that's very easy to find in, uh, when you have an SDE is correlation, right? So if you look at the correlation matrix now, so that's the part on realized volatilities and correlations. If you look at the correlation in this model now, the correlation, realized correlation between asset returns is going to be given by sigma plus all those terms in red. So remember, sigma was the fundamental correlation. But here what you see is that the realized correlation that you observe in the market is not necessarily equal to the fundamental correlation. Actually, it's going to be modified by those terms in red here. If we look now at those terms in red, what do they represent? What are the inputs for those terms in red? Well, first, you have this vector lambda, which appears here at order one in this term here at order two. What's lambda? Lambda is actually the size of each fund as a function of the liquidity of the asset. So here, lambda I, I, for example, it's alpha I divided by DI. So it's the size of the fund in one asset divided by the liquidity of this asset. So if you think about that, the smaller the lambda, the closer the lambda to zero, the more liquid the asset, right? Because it means that the market depth of the asset is very large or it means that the positions of the fund is very small compared to the liquidity. So lambda is a measure of the fund's size as a function of the liquidity. Here you see that in a market where market depth are infinite, so that's typically Black & Scholes or any traditional mar market, di is infinite. So lambda are equal to zero, right? So of course, all those terms in red, they disappear 
So what we find, of course, is that in a market where the funds invest in infinitely liquid markets, but also in a market where the funds have positions which are negligible compared to the liquidities, things are going to behave as the fundamentals. Those terms in red are going to disappear. That's very intuitive, right? You are in a market where you are so small compared to the liquidity that even when you are trading a lot, you're not trading that much compared to the liquidity, so you're not going to impact prices. Okay. So what else appears? What else appears is this F prime. Remember, F is the liquidation schedule. And F prime, actually, what is that? Is the rate at which you liquidate. Are you going to liquidate fast or not? If you remember the, the shape of this F, we said that as long as there are no fire sales, which is here, F is constant. So as long as I'm in, in this area, F is constant. So F prime is going to be equal to 0. Right? And of course, if you look at this limit in terms of correlation, F prime here, if you're in the zone where you are not liquidating, F is constant, F prime is equal to zero, so those terms disappear. Okay. So once again, naturally, if I'm in a situation where I might have an impact, but I'm not liquidating, of course, assets are going to behave in a, in a, in a fundamental manner. But now the interesting case is when that's not verified. Typically, the case when I have to engage in liquidations, so F prime is strictly positive, and I have positions which are of the same order of magnitude as the liquidity. So the lambda is not zero this time. This time, those terms in red can be of the same order of magnitude as this sigma. So you end up in an endogenous manner, starting from a constant covariance matrix, you end up with a covariance matrix which is here, which can be significantly different from Fundamentals depends on liquidities, depends on fund values, and so it go, it's going to be path dependent. Right? So for, for those who are interested in, in uh, covariance modeling, here we're, doing, we're obtaining something which is interesting, which is starting from co constant covariances, so a homocedastic setting. By adding feedback, you are ending up with a heterocedastic covariance structure, something which varies in time, path dependent. Okay. And that comes from just the feedback. Okay. So interesting thing is that the realized covariance is the fundamental covariance plus an excess covariance which is path dependent and liquidity dependent. Okay. So now, if we look now at the risk and the spillover effects. Now, I'm going to look at the variance of myself in this market. So I'm a big fund. I have positions alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n, right? And sometimes, when my fund value decreases too much, I have to liquidate. Okay. What's my variance now? Well, once again, my variance is going to have a nice decomposition, which is a fundamental variance, which is here, pi sigma pi, which is my variance which would be my, the variance that I expect, plus those terms in red which are here. And those terms in red, once again, they are liquidity dependent and path dependent. Okay. So it means that my variance is going to be different from the variance that I expect. And the only reason is because myself, I am sub subject to a rule and I'm affecting the prices in a systematic manner. What's interesting here, is that all those terms in red here, they are positive. So what does that mean? It means that exactly in the scenarios where I'm going to liquidate assets, I'm going to increase my own variance. So that's something which shows how the benefits of diversification are reduced. Right? As a fund manager, you spend a lot of time trying to diversify your portfolio, build it in a very nice manner so that when things go bad, this diversification provides you as a, with a cushion and with a safety. But the problem is that because of your own liquidations, you're going to make exactly in the worst scenarios, you're going to make your variance increase. What's interesting here is that you know exactly by how much 
It's just a function of your model parameters, right? You just have to e estimate the liquidity of the assets, which can be done by some econometric studies, and have to know at which rate you liquidate, which is also known because, for example, for a bank, you know the rule that you are, that, that you are subject to. So that's a limit of the, divers the classical diversification effects. Because of your endogenous feedback, you're going to decrease the diversification effects that you expected. You're going to observe vo volatilities which are higher than what you expected. Very often it comes as a surprise, but actually it's not a surprise. It's because of you, right? It's your own actions. Typically, the London whale guy. This big guy who liquidated his portfolio, lost six billion and had a huge volatility. No one else was trading except him, right? It's himself. Okay. Of course, once again, you have to have positions which are large enough compared to the liquidity. Someone which is intermediate with a large liquidity, uh, trading in an asset with a large liquidity would not have this kind of, of uh, effects. Yes? Uh, Rafael is not, doesn't have, agree. No, 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 because you have the case of London Way, where you, have, you also have the, uh, I mean, I'm around also with a situation like this, but you have the, uh, uh, more often, cases where uh, a lot of, they, they it's like a move in, in the asset management which takes a very parallel position. And uh, the, there's a famous case, you know, Ah, yeah, so that's, a, yeah, the, so the, the, that's true. The D, so just that when, when all that phenomenon comes in, the D decreases because yeah. you know, people become scared. So that's a very interesting point. That's actually something that I put here. First, this happens even without liquidity drying up. But the problem is that in practice, when that happens, the D, the liquidity, the depth of the asset uh, liquidity decreases in the same time, right? And that's a very important point that I don't take into account here, that's true, that in those bad cases where endogenously you increase your variance, also exo kind of endogenously also, the liquidity is going to decrease and is going to, uh, to deteriorate even further your volatilities. All right, so now something to come back to your first remark, uh, Raphael, is the spillovers, right? Imagine now that I'm this fund, and I'm liquidating my positions alpha, right? So my own effect, my effect on myself is given here, right? So now the real question is, what's the effect on all other people, right? How am I going to affect those guys? Well, once again, I'm looking here at a small fund who has positions mu t, right? And I'm the big fund, and I'm liquidating my positions alpha, right? What's the variance of this fund mu, right? I have the same decomposition for my variance. Additive decomposition, fundamental variance for my, for my fund, plus endogenous variance. Okay. The thing here which is more interesting is that this time, those terms in red, they are not necessarily positive. So it means that because I liquidate, it's not necessarily bad for you. It just depends on your positions compared to mine. Right? And actually, if you look closely to this equation, you see something, a quantity very interesting which is appearing, which is lambda scalar pi mu, which is my position scalar your positions. So what's interesting is what we called with Rama the liquidity weighted overlap, lambda scalar pi mu, which is the scalar product between the vector which is alpha divided by d, so size of my position divided by the liquidity, times how much cash you put in each asset. Your, my effect on your variance will be order of one plus order two in this value here. And it's interesting because if you have positions which are close to mine, this will be very large. So of course your variance is going to be increased significantly because of my liquidations. If you have positions which are the opposite of mine, this will be very negative. 
So actually, it's good for you that I'm liquidating. But what's interesting is that if your positions are orthogonal to mine, you won't even feel that. That's going to be zero. Right? And the orthogonality condition is here. And what's interesting is that the orthogonality condition cons uh, is weighted by liquidity. So it means that if we have some overlap in our portfolios, it might be bad that I liquidate for you. Right? But actually, if our overlap only concerns liquid assets, we don't care. Because when I liquidate portfolio, my portfolio, if I liquidate some liquid assets and some illiquid assets, I'm not going to impact liquid assets. If the only common commonality with me is liquid assets, you're not going to be impacted by that. Okay. So that's a very, I think, very strong uh, result that we got, which is that the overlaps between portfolios in terms of contagions, they are, uh, they are uh, 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 exacerbated by commonality in illiquid assets. Right? And what's important is this. Well, that, so here it's illiquid, but that can become illiquid. So assets which, in the end, have a small DI in this year. Right? And actually, if we think about the hedge fund crash of 2007, the, October 2000, uh, the August 2007 hedge fund crash that I, I told you about, this quant event, if we want to reinterpret this crash uh, uh, with, our, with the setting that I exposed here, here, what I told you is that there was a big fund which was owned by Goldman, which liquidated. So you had a big fund, positions alpha, which were liquidated. Okay. All the other hedge funds had positions mu, which were very close to this alpha. So actually, the overlap was very big. So this term was large. And actually, that's what observed is that the, the volatility of those funds increased significantly during this liquidation. On the contrary, if you look at the index funds, the positions mu of the index funds are by definition orthogonal to the positions alpha of a, long, of a market neutral fund. So actually, when you look at index funds versus market neutral funds, this scalar product is close to zero. And that's why for these index funds, they had, a, the, they had no impact from the liquidation of this Goldman Sachs hedge fund, right? Because their, their positions, which were only long-only positions, were orthogonal to the long-short positions which were being liquidated. Okay? On the contrary, all the other long-short positions were very collinear to the ones which were liquidated. And actually here was a good example of that happening without liquidity drying up, because on the equities, there was no significant impact on that. Okay? All right, so that's for this continuous time dynamics that, uh, that we obtain, and that enables to obtain tractable formulas of everything, correlations, volatilities, volatility of yourself, volatility of others in the firm, right? So it's, it's interesting now in terms of risk management, because when you're a fund and you know that you might have those effects, you can try to change your allocations or at least try to uh, uh, provision some, fun, some, some cash for those particular scenarios which are here. Okay. At least when you are aware of that, it makes a big difference in terms of risk management. There's a lot of ways to hedge this risk, right? You can buy uh, 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 put options with a 50% strike or something like that to, to try to, 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 to hedge this tail risk, right? Because this is tail risk. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to come to the last part of this uh, talk, which is about risk measures. So that's a joint work with Georges that we started uh, during my visit last year. So I'm going to simplify a little bit the setting that I presented to try to obtain tractable formulas for risk measures. Right? So here we obtain volatilities, correlations. But what about the risk measures? That's the things which are used by funds to monitor their risk, by you at risk, expected shortfall, or other types of risk measures, right? So the first thing which motivated this work is the fact that if you look at the, the, how risk measures are, 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 are calculated and computed 
right? You see that the risk measures, they uh, essentially focus on mark-to-market losses, right? So actually, when you have a portfolio, how do you measure the risk of a portfolio, right? Really, to, to, to broadly speaking, you're looking at the losses in the worst scenarios for your portfolio, and this is going to give you a measure for your risk. But you're going to look at the losses in the market, right? Mark to market losses, right? So typically, you're going to use a value at risk or expected shortfall, and you're going to look at the PL distribution of a given risk horizon and calculate a certain risk value of risk, right? Value, value at risk or expected shortfall or anything, anything which is more complicated, right? And actually, for those who deal with risk, you know, you, 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 there's a lot of theory about risk measures. And, uh, and we put a lot of emphasis, for example, on coherent risk measures. And that's typically something which is linear, right? And what, I, what do I mean by linear? It's that, in practice, most of the risk measures which are used, and typically value at risk and expected shortfall, they are linear risk measures. So it means that if I have a portfolio and my risk is 1 billion, if you have the same portfolio but 10 times bigger, your risk will be 10 billion if you calculate it with VAR or with expected shortfall. The problem is that if something bad happens in the market and I have to liquidate some assets and you have to liquidate some assets, it's going to be much more difficult for you to liquidate assets because you're 10 times bigger than I am. And you see that your liquidation costs are going to be much more than 10 times my liquidation costs. So it's not going to be linear anymore. So, so in that precise example, if the two people are on top of that the same position, then you with your one billion is impacted by the fact that someone else has ten billion. Yes, so that's going to impact my my own risk. Oh, yeah. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because your alignment with the rest of the market is uh, because, I, because I'm in a crowded strategy, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <coughs> so if you think about those risk measures, why do we measure risk? We measure risk because we want to have an idea about what happens in an extreme scenario, right? And what's an ex so extreme losses. So typically, a regulator, banking regulator, is going to impose capital requirement for a bank, so, uh, so the, uh, uh, impose that the bank holds enough capital compared to the size and risk of the, of the bank because it needs to make sure that the bank has enough to face an extreme event. Right? Same thing if you look at a, a, a CCP, right? A CCP is going to ask for an initial margin and a variation margin because they need to make sure that if things go bad, you have enough to pay for the mark-to-market -market variation. Okay? But actually, what does that mean? It means that you're calculating risk to have an idea about your loss in a bad scenario. But the problem is that when a bad scenario in the market mater is materialized, it often goes along with liquidations. Right? Because I'm constrained, for example, by a capital ratio constraint or liquidity, ratio constra liquidity coverage ratio constraint, something like that. When I'm hit by a bad event in the market, I'm going to have, on top of that, to liquidate some assets. So on top of my mark-to-market loss, I'm going to suffer from losses due to liquidation costs. And as of those traditional risk measures, those liquidation costs are never taken into account anywhere. Right. So that means that the risk which is computed uh, using value at risk or using expected shortfall, et cetera, et cetera, those traditional risk measures, focuses only on the mark-to-market risk, but completely forgets the liquidation risk or the liquidity risk, more generally, right? You never input in your risk calculation any uh, measure of liquidity of your assets. And that's something which is very surprising and still very interesting. What does that mean? In another, another way to see that. Imagine you have two assets, one which is liquid, one which is illiquid. If those two assets have exactly the same statistical distribution in the past, well, the risk measures for those two assets is going to be the same. 
if you estimate by the VAR or by the expected shortfall. Because you don't take into account the liquidity of each. But intuitively, you understand that if you have a portfolio of liquid assets and a portfolio of illiquid assets, you should add on a risk for this portfolio of illiquid assets, even if they have the same statistical mark-to-market distributions. So something is, is missing in those uh, uh, risk uh, uh, measurements, and you have some, some fiascos over the past, right, uh, which were associated with the miscalculation of risk. So once again, one of the, the best examples is this case of this London way, right, this, this guy who uh, accumulated very big positions in the CDX IG9, so hundreds of billions in long shorts and, uh, and different maturities in credit indices, right? And who, when he tried to liquidate those, those uh, uh, positions, ended up with a loss which, is 12, which was 12 time, times bigger, bigger than what was expected. Okay. If you look at this particular case, the risk management which was done, was done using the classical risk measures which scaled linearly. So it means that in order to calculate the risk of the London whale, so once again, if you remember, I told you that the value at risk was estimated at, at 500 million, which was 12 times less than the 6 billion loss, right? But how do you find the 500 million? You just look at the statistical distribution of the, uh, the um, CDX IG9, right? and look at the extreme events of the CDX IG9 over, I don't know, three, four, five years, right? And then compute this, this value. The only problem is that never in the history of CDX IG9 had anyone accumulated so large positions. So you completely missed the possibility that something linked to liquidity could happen in this, in this setting, okay? So this is one example. Right? Another example that I'm sure Raphael is fond of is the example of LTCM, right? Yes, well, yeah, but Carvier was done privately, right? So... No, but it was SAP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, they wanted to liquidate in one day, and the loss finally was twice what it should it's, It was five billion instead of, uh, I don't know, one million, one billion, or... Yeah? Yeah. Maybe the, this uh, LTCM was even more... Uh, 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 Re remarkable because, so if you don't know. No, it's LTCM, no, let him, let no, him. Yeah, but the first losses was, were huge for LTCM. And that was I not expected was because they had... Was yeah, yeah, but still. Was taken by Goldman and Goldman progressively liquidated the position. The actual loss at the end was uh, six or seven hundred million. It was below a billion. So that was another example where, on the contrary, the people had been clever enough to take the time to liquidate. They had still to be bailed out, right? Because of that. Because of these correlations. They cried, they yeah. cried the, it's the Fed that imposed that. Yeah. So to, to come back to Ariel's remark, now uh, here you see that we need a, a setting which takes into account the liquidity of the assets, right? And the fact that you may have to liquidate in some scenarios. So, so a guy like a fraud like Carviel or a, a guy which like the London whale who accumulated too many, too large positions, etc. So one thing is, in the case of Carviel, or in the case of London whale, the liquidation was imposed by the management, right? And they say, okay, you just liquidate, right? So it's very difficult to plan that, okay? One other, th one thing where it's clearly endogenous uh, deals with banks, right? And typically, if you look at a bank, or let's say a fund, right? A fund is usually con uh, constrained by leverage, right? So it means that <coughs> the fund will be able, will, have, uh, will, will be authorized to borrow, but not too much, 
right? And the ratio between the borrowing and the equity is what we call the leverage. So actually, it's not exactly what I use here. Here, I call the leverage as the size of the fund divided by the equity of the fund. Right? For banks, it's exactly the, uh, the, the inverse ratio, which is equity divided by value, which is the capital leverage ratio, which, is, which has to be larger than 3% in Basel III. For funds, you, all, you very often have leverage lower than a certain value. And typically, this is a rule which is imposed by the fund manager himself or herself, which says, OK, I want to find some investors, but I don't want to scare them too much. So I'm going to impose on my fund that I'm not going to get more than 10 times leverage, something like that. Right? So it depends on the fund. It depends sometimes on regulators. Right? And for banks, actually, it's exactly the reg regulators. Right? So now imagine that the fund loses a certain percentage, a certain percentage in, the, in, the, in, the, in the assets, right? So you denote L here, the percentage loss for the fund. So 5%, 10% in the asset, right? So the value of the, of the fund goes from V to V times 1 minus L, right? That's OK. Right? So the loss in dollars, how much is that? It's V times L, right? OK. So now. The fund loses V times L. If the equity of the fund is below V times L, the fund is insolvent. Right? So here in the model, we're going to say that the fund goes bankrupt and is liquidated. But if the fund has enough equity, which is most likely the case, right? the fund is going to absorb this loss. But what is going to absorb the loss exactly? It's the equity of the fund which is going to absorb the loss. So the equity of the fund, which was E here, is going to decrease from E to E minus the loss, which is LV. Okay. Okay, so that's the, the typical mechanism of absorbing loss. Right? And now you can compute again the, the, the leverage ratio. What's the leverage ratio? Once again, leverage ratio is size of my, of my fund divided by equity of the fund. Initially, size was V, equity was E, but after the loss, Size is V times 1 minus L, and equity is E minus LV. And actually, if you, if you look at this function here, it's an increasing function of L. So it means that the more I lose, the more my leverage increases. So if my loss is not too big, my leverage is maybe going to stay below L max, which is the maximum which is authorized. But if my leverage is big, if my loss is big enough, so L is above here, actually this L star, which is a, a threshold which you can compute explicitly, right? What happens is that the fund is going to violate its leverage constraint. So it means that the loss is big enough so that the fund, the, the leverage ratio here, which is here of the fund, is above L max. So now you have a fund which is still alive, but has a leverage ratio which is too large. So what can the fund do? When the leverage ratio is too large, when a ratio is too large in general, either you decrease the numerator or you increase the denominator. Right? So what does it mean increasing the denominator? Once again, it means increasing the equity. So we discussed about that at the beginning of the, the course. This is something that typically a financial institution is going to try to avoid because first, in general, it dilutes previous investors, but especially after a shock, it's very costly to issue equity. So what instead is, going the, to, is the financial institution going to do? It's going to decrease the numerator. So it means that it's going to sell assets. And what's interesting is that you know exactly how much it's going to sell. The proportion here is given by this function, 1 minus here. And actually, you can draw that. And it's the blue curve here, which is that here on the x-axis, you have the, the L, the percentage loss here. So as long as L here is lower than 1%, so here I'm taking a fund which, is, which has a leverage of 25. So conversely, a capital ratio of 4%. And the, the, the maximum leverage is 33, 
So it means that the capital ratio should be larger than 3%. So it's exactly the Basel rule, right? Yeah. Basel, new Basel III rule says that the capital ratio has to be larger than 3%, leverage capital ratio. So here, if you look at L here, you have losses. You see that as long as the loss is below 1%, the volume that you liquidate is zero. The proportion of the fund that you liquidate is zero. So once again, as long as you don't lose in a, uh, too much, you don't do anything. Okay. But then, as soon as you go above this 1% loss, you have to liquidate. And it's not your choice, right? It's not because you want to liquidate and it's strateg tra strategically optimal or something, right? Actually, you don't want to liquidate precisely at that moment, right? Because price has already decreased, right? So you don't want to sell after a decrease especially a large decrease, especially if you believe that there is some kind of a mean reversion somewhere and that prices may increase back. So it's not your choice. It's because of a regulator for a bank or it's because of your own rules for a, for a fund. It's not your choice. It's a rule, exogenous rule, which forces you to liquidate. So endogenously, you're going to liquidate here. And this is going to be an explicit function of your of your, of your loss, right? And to come back to Ariel's comment here, as long as you have this rule, this rule will, n will not change. This, pro this liquidation rule doesn't change, okay? What you see here is that, of course, the more you lose, the more you liquidate. And there is a threshold, which is here, so I think it's 4%, yes. And actually, that's normal, right? Because the capital ratio is 4%, is that when your assets lose more than 4%, you don't have enough equity to absorb the loss. So here in the model, you liquidate everything. So your whole portfolio is liquidated, okay? Actually, in practice, that's a bit different, right? So that's what we did with Georgia. But actually, in practice, when you have a very large shock and you have to liquidate, and you're like insolvent and you're being liquidated by the competent regulator, you take time to liquidate, right? That's, you what? Yeah, but you have to, right? But if, when you liquidate it, it's like, it's like Raphael said, you have, you have time to liquidate, right? But in those cases which are here, actually you don't have time, right? In here, you don't have time. As long as you're alive, you have to comply quite quickly, right? So that's an example of a bank, but same thing for a, a, a CCP, right? When you look at a CCP, you put some cash in your, in your account at the CCP. If you have an extreme shock, in your portfolio, right? You might not have enough cash in your account to compensate for that shock. What can you do? You can liquidate some assets to compensate for that loss, right? But in this case, you really don't have a lot of time because you have to comply with the CCP requirement by the end of the day, right? And sometimes it's even twice a day, okay? And that's an extreme case that we studied with Georgia, which is that in the case of a CCP, when you have extreme shock, which is typically what a CCP, a clearinghouse is interested in, because you don't have enough to pay your margin call or your initial margin for the next day, you're gonna have to liquidate. But in this case, you have to go very fast because the CCP is, going to, is not going to give you a lot of time to do that. Actually, you have to, do, to comply at the end of every day. Okay? You see that all those rules, they're imposed by, the, by external uh, uh, entities, right? Basel III or your central bank is going to impose you a 3% or maximum 33 leverage for your portfolio. A fund manager is going to have a rule which says, okay, I'm not gonna exceed 30 leverage. A CCP is going to ask you to have an initial margin which is large enough to, to, to uh, compensate for extreme losses, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So all those things, this F, the, the, those functions phi that I showed, the thing, the, 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 their problem is that they are imposed exogenously, okay? It's either the regulator, the, 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 the CCP, or yourself, which imposes that, okay? Actually, before going to further, the regulator is clearly aware of that problem, right? The regulator knows that by imposing capital constraints, they might have 
an effect which is that after a large shock, banks are going to sell assets. Right? But the problem is that they have to impose some capital constraints somewhere because otherwise banks take too much risk. Okay? So over the last years, there has been a, a lot of thinking which was done by regulators uh, in order to try to mitigate this undesirable effect of, of capital constraints, right? So there's a lot of proposals, some of them which are currently implemented, uh, in order to mitigate those effects. So one proposal was to impose counter-cyclical capital requirements, which is that in good times, the regulator is going to impose to the bank to hold more capital so that it's going to, to force the bank to build a larger cushion of equity, a larger reserve of equity. And then if times go bad, they're going to allow the bank to have a lower capital ratio so that it's going to uh, not to force the bank to sell assets and potentially make a spiral of losses. That's one thing which was proposed by regulators. And actually, that's... Uh, that's, uh, that's a, a, a thing which is going to be, a, a, which is in discussions in terms of implementation, right? Another thing which was proposed was to, uh, uh, to include convert uh, um, contingent convertible debt in the balance sheet of banks, right? So what's contingent convertible debt? Contingent convertible debt is a debt security which can be converted into equity if things go bad, okay? So typically, when, is, when are things going bad? Typically, things are going bad when you are, in this case here, which is that you had a shock, you're still alive, but your capital ratio is too low or your leverage is too high. The regulator knows that this is going to incentivize people to sell, but also, if you add uh, uh, if you add contingent convertible bonds, or COCOs, right, this debt is going to be converted into equity. So actually, automatically, the numerator is going to be increased. The denominator is going to be increased here, right? That was in discussions, and that's uh, 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 after the, since the final, the, the 2008-2009 subprime crisis, or 2007-2008 subprime crisis, but there's a lot of limitations in imposing banks to hold contingent convertible bonds. And one of them is that there's a lot of manipulation which are possible on con contingent convertible bonds, right? So as of now, we don't really have a, an ETA, a deadline, as to when this is going to be in practice imposed and in which form, right? All right. OK, so now let's look now at a more simple model in order to try to quantify the, 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 the impact in terms of risk measures, right? So I'm going to look at a one period model this time. And simpler, so S01 is price of asset one at date zero, S0N, price of asset N at date zero, right? And the return of asset I is this thing. So this is a matrix product. A is an N by N matrix. Xi is an N dimensional vector. Xi is an n-dimensional vector, and I take the, I, the, the component number i of this n-dimensional vector that's going to be the, the return of asset i, right? So here, the Xi, they are, I, I, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, they are independent and, ga and uh, standard Gaussians, right? And there is a correlation which is hidden in this A, and A a transpose is sigma, the fundamental covariance matrix, okay? So you have a market with a fundamental covariance structure, right? And if you look at the fund here, you look at the fund which has positions delta zero i in each asset i. So the value of the fund is V, right? And the proportions invested in, ca in each asset are given by this vector x, right? So here, for example, this quantity, delta zero one S zero one, is the quantity of cash that I put in asset one. When I div divide by V, the value of the fund, it's the proportion of cash that I put in asset one, right? 
So x is the, the vector of allocations in terms of proportions, right? So maybe 10%, 20%, 30%, and 50%, okay? Or 40%, actually, all right? And if you look at this market for this fund, you can calculate the classical value at risk and the classical expected shortfall, right? And it's, it can be computed explicitly. So the value at risk is given by this formula. The expected shortfall is slightly more complicated. But as expected, as you know, it's something which is proportional to the fund value, V, and proportional to the volatility of the fund, which is here. So here, just to tell you, Z is a standard Gaussian and N is the, the, the cumulative distribution function of the Gaussian law, okay? But just the, the idea is that in this case, you have something, risk measures which are proportional to the fund value, okay? The problem is that if you look at the, this fund, the loss in percentage is given by this scalar product here. And what we saw, what was the whole topic, the point of the, the, last, uh, uh, the last half hour is to say, was to say that when the loss is too large, when X is too large, the fund may need to liquidate some assets. And actually, if I denote Fi of X, the proportion of assets I, which is liquidated, the loss for the fund can be written like that here. So that's here in, in, in black the fundamental loss, plus the terms in red here, which are generated by the fund's own liquidations, okay? If you look at the terms in red here, you see here first that the terms in black, <coughs> they are linear in fund size. But the terms in red here, it's not linear anymore. It's quadratic in fund size, okay? And it depends heavily on liquidity. And that's something that's going to be non-negligible as soon as Fi is non-negligible, so as soon as you liquidate assets. So in the bad scenarios, when you liquidate assets, you're going to increase naturally your loss. And you're going to increase that not in a linear manner, but in a quadratic manner. Okay? So much more than what you expected. Actually here, the quadratic term comes from the fact that the impact is linear. If you took an impact which was a square root impact, the power here would be three halves, which is actually the power of the impact that Marco presented a few years ago, I remember in Buzios, uh, uh, which was the, an additional term uh, uh, in here. So it's not a structural thing to have a, uh, something which is quadratic. It's really linked to the fact that I chose a linear impact, right? So linear impact means that the impact is linear in delta, but because my positions are also linear in delta, the impact, final impact on my price will be delta times delta, so the square, okay? All right, so now what we did with Georges was to look at a particular function which was a, a, a really extreme case. Imagine that my liquidation function is the following. As, as long as my fund loss is below gamma, I don't do anything, so I liquidate zero. And as soon as it's above gamma, I liquidate everything. So it's kind of zero one, right? But that's typically what can happen in a, in a, for, a, uh, for a buy and hold strategy where you have to, to liquidate only in an extreme event. Well, in this case, which is a, a, a simplifying case, right? Things are much smoother in real life, right? You liquidate more in a much smoother manner, just uh, not, not as abruptly as here. In this case, you can compute the VAR and the expected shortfall. So you have the, 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 the technical results which are here. But what's interesting here to notice is are the terms in red here, which are the liquidity adjustments of the existing risk measures. What you see here is that, for example, let's take this last line here. The VAR in the model where you take into account the feedback of your own liquidations is equal to the previous VAR plus a term which is quadratic in your size. Right. Same thing for the expected shortfall. Right. Actually, as long as you're not big, those terms in red, they are negligible because your positions 
will be small compared to the liquidity. Once again, if I liquidate a few hundred dollars on the S&P 500, no one's going to care, right? Because the liquidity is so big. But if you're the London whale and you liquidate a few hundred billions on the market, which is a few hundred billions, this is going to be significant. And actually, when you look at the London whale, we calibrated those figures with uh, Rama in a previous paper. The VAR here, the fundamental VAR, was estimated, I told you, to 500 million. The liquidity, liquidity adjustment was for 5.5 uh, billion. The sum was the loss, which was 6 billion. Okay. This liquidity loss happens in only extreme cases. Once again, it's only when things go super, super bad for you. But the whole point of risk is looking at things when, 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 looking at things when the market is going very bad. Right? So you have to adjust for that. And you know that when things are going to go bad, you're going to have to liquidate some assets and readjust your positions. One thing is looking at this adjustment. You see that this sum is very easy to compute, right? It's just a quadratic version of your size divided by the liquidity. And you sum over all the assets that you have. So the value here is something in, in, uh, uh, in size. Yeah. OK. All right, so now I think I'm almost done in terms of time. So I'm going to conclude very quickly uh, to say that, well, the, 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 the framework that I proposed, uh, well, first, that feedback effects in financial markets are something which are well known and that should be taken into account in existing models. The, most existing models, they deal with a, an exogenous, they propose an exogenous representation of asset prices. Right? In almost all cases of financial markets, it works, except in cases where you have large systematic supply and demand. And the adjustment you have to do to the existing model is very small, right? The model, the discrete time model that I presented is very easy. It's your own favorite model adjusted with the systematic supply and demand. So the adjustment is very small. It's, it's not complicated. The formulas that we obtain are also tractable, so it's not very complicated either, right? But by taking into account those adjustments, you are able to anticipate the effect of, those, uh, of the feedback from large investors and to adjust the risk of your portfolio to this liquidity risk, which is currently underestimated. So don't be bothered by the fact that most of the results that I presented are simplified things which are, for example, Black and Scholes or linear price impact or constant covariance matrix. In practice, you might be in your fund or in your bank or something like that and have a very complicated model for the dynamics, a very complicated model for, for covariances, a very complicated model for the DI, the, the price impact, and then you input the feedback. Right? It's just an adjustment of existing models. And you see that enab it enables in a very easy manner to account for lots of systematic behavior that you observe in a financial market. Right? So I think I'm done. So yeah, so there's a few papers, if you're interested, which deal with the, with the talk that I gave today. So actually, the talk that I gave today is kind of a, an, a, a condensed summary of all those papers. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lakshit. I think I'm in time, yeah? Yes, you, are, you did it beautifully. So we have time for a few questions. I've already had a lot of questions. Yeah, he had too yeah. many questions. Rafael seems to have yeah. a lot of questions still. Yeah. So why don't you, well, let, let, before you do your comments, let's see if anyone else has some other comments. And, uh, okay. Just a second, just a second. Sorry. Can you extract uh, from correlation data uh, the, the examples that you, that you mentioned at the beginning of the presentations? Do you think that you can extract from the correlation data something uh, related to concentration and liquidity risk uh, 
for the assets for the current time, for the current, uh, which assets have the most uh, risk of, uh, uh, of liquidation going into the future? So, so you mean in a forward-looking manner? Yes. No, you can't. Because you need to know uh, the, well, the holdings of large institutions and how they trade. So if you have that, you can do that. And typically, if you're a big bank, you know that you're kind of making the market. So you know actually, and you know that people are, uh, most other banks are going to have very similar positions as you have, right? So you have an idea. But to, to implement this, those kinds of things, you have to know this alpha, right? So either you're the bank and you are trying to anticipate your own effects, or you have an idea about the alpha, and then you can compute all the quantities that, you, that we have here. Because the unwinding of the position is nonlinear, and uh, at the beginning of the unwinding, you could kind of start feeling uh, some effects on the, on the correlation. I don't know if they, they, they would be uh, relevant enough so that you can you know, uh, tag a, a, a risk of unwinding. But so that's, yeah, so that's another thing. So that's more strategic, right? It may happen that, so that's actually something that I implemented in a fund in the US, but it may happen that you have a very stable correlation structure, typically the one that I showed in uh, Black and Scholes, right? And then you have a move, sudden move. So when you observe this sudden move, you can say, okay, I am going to interpret this sudden move be, uh, by explaining that by someone who is trading in a systematic manner. Right? And then it's possible to implicit what the guy is trading, but it's backward looking. Once you identify this alpha, you can say, okay, I'm pretty sure that this guy is, conti is going to continue. And then you can do that. Okay. Thank you. But you have to be sure, because if the guy stopped and you're doing the wrong thing, you're screwed, right? Because it will make my comments much shorter. <laughs> because, OK, he says you can't. In fact, you can. <laughs> not, not with what I did here. But no, no, no. But that the, the, I mean, f first of all, I mean, uh, uh, well, it's not to, to advertise what I'm going to do, but it will, I could not dream of a better introduction to my stuff on polymodels. Perfect. <laughs> OK. Now, uh, precisely to your question, the, 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 the attitude is to make a statistical estimate based on whatever you are observing in the market, especially in the nonlinear response of, uh, because what happens before crisis is that you see an increase in nonlinear response. So the nonlinear response of uh, uh, some assets to some indices and to some moves is precisely the sign that his mechanism is being in place. And you can even measure it. So you can have an implicit uh, value, a statistical estimate of that. Once you have identified that mechanism, then you can estimate the parameters of the mechanism based on what you observe. And you see the thing. The thing that I've proposed to the regulator is precisely to, that the banks should declare their sensitivities instead of declaring yeah. their positions. They should declare their sensitivities in a nonlinear manner to different uh, assets. As a regulator, then you receive, you know, the major banks, you know, uh, uh, JP, uh, Morgan Stanley, Goldman, etc. Uh, uh, how they are sensitive to different risk factors. Once you get that sensitivity, then you have his picture, and then you can put in place what is the likely scenarios that may occur potentially, uh, because you have not the detailed position. You don't need the detailed position. That's no. a big mistake. You know, those, those, all those guys at the OFR, they believe that you need to, you need to get all the granular stuff. No. You need no, no, no. You need, you need to have the major impact. Yeah. And the banks, in, instead of trying to give, you know, they, they should give some aggregated exposure and even, uh, you know, more than exposure, precisely anticipated sensitivities. And this is not only measurable, this is enforceable. That is, uh, after the fact, you can force the bank to produce figures that are reliable by saying, okay, well, if after the fact something occurs, you have to tell me that you have declared the risk that was occurring 
in that stuff. So uh, I've, I've prepared precisely, I mean, I've made a proposal to regulators that they have rejected because it was, uh, um, it, it was, instead of being based on, on, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, accounting facts, it was based on declaration from banks, which were enforceable, and it got very bad reaction from regulators. It answers a, all the questions that you're asking. So, well, I, I like that, you know, we, we have to speak a bit stronger to regulators about that. But the, this is, uh, the idea is that once you get this mechanism, you get all the elements to do a statistical analysis. It's absolutely fantastic. You have to realize what, what that represents. Any further questions? No? If there are no further questions, let's thank uh, Lakshit again and all the contributions from the audience. <laughs>